Okay, I guess we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kurt Dietrich, Superintendent of Schools of the North Penn School District. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the North Penn School District Community Forum. And the topic this evening is fair funding of schools. We've had some very successful school uh, community engagement activities over the years. We've had community forums, including one where we had representatives from our state legislature with us. And we thought we would repeat that this year and invite them back. And we invited all of our state legislators. Unfortunately, we had uh, some that were able to attend this evening. They'll be with us in just a minute. Um, but I will introduce them at this point. With us this evening, we have the Representative Robert Gottschall. We have Representative Kate Harper. We have Representative Todd Stevens. And also with us this evening, we have Tina Valletta, who is the Director of Community and Government Relations for the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. And we'll bring them up in just a minute. Some of you are watching at home, uh, either on North Penn Television or you're watching it through the website. If you would like to submit questions, we will take questions, and that's a big part of this evening, is the questions from the audience. We will also take those who are viewing this from home, and we'll take those questions uh, one of two ways. You can click on our website and uh, send questions through that link, or you can also send questions through nptv at npen.org. And Kyle Berger is here this evening with us, and Kyle will be uh, gathering those questions and, and helping us with uh, presenting those for the panel to uh, address. Just a few quick facts about North Penn School District. The real estate taxes constitute approximately 72% of our budget, and 29% of the real estate taxes come from the commercial industrial base in North Penn School District. The rest of it would be from homeowners. The median assessed value of each homestead property is $147,455, and the tax bill then would be $3,418. The earned income tax does constitute approximately 6% of our budget in North Penn School District, and our state funding constitutes 18% of our budget. Put this slide in because you can get a feel for uh, the largest school districts. North Penn is the seventh largest school district in the state. Uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are the two largest school districts. Uh, funding is a bit different for the city schools like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but you can see there Central Bucks, Reading, Allentown, Bethlehem, then North Penn, Upper Darby, you can see that list. And you can see a high of 137,000 students uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, 26,000 in Pittsburgh on down to North Penn at 12,734. And in the top 25, uh, you can go down to East Penn at number 25 with 8,000. And then contrast that with the smallest school districts in the state. And you can see uh, the smallest would be 214 students in the entire district in Austin Area School District in Potter County. Some others in the 200 and 300, 400, 500, 600 range for the entire school district. So quite a disparity in the state. The largest 20-year uh, school district increases and decreases in terms of student enrollment. And in this particular slide, I did borrow this from the uh, PASBO presentation that was done to the Basic Ed Funding Commission. Excluding charter enrollments, uh, increase Central Bucks, the largest increase in the last 20 years at 7,990 new students compared to 20 years ago. And you can see on through the list there some uh, local districts in terms of Montgomery County, Spring Ford, Perkiomen Valley. Uh, you see some other, uh, on the other side there, the decreases. Philadelphia down 65,000 students. Pittsburgh down 13. Chester Upland down 4,500. On down through uh, Bristol Township there, down 1,900 students. So you see some increases in the state in the last 20 years, and you see some decreases. In terms of organizing it by county, uh, in Lehigh County you see six school districts with increases, three with decreases. Montgomery County, almost all uh, school districts with increases. Uh, overall enrollment change in Montgomery County, plus 20,000 students in the last 20 years, and 20 of the school districts having increases in their student population. 
Incidentally, we'll have this um, PowerPoint available for those of you that want to go back and revisit it. And likewise, if there are any questions this evening or you'd like us to find a particular slide uh, and ask some questions, we'll take questions and certainly find the slide uh, if you'd like to be able to refer to it. So to summarize, since 93, 94, and that year is important, we'll find that out in just a minute. That's the last time we really stuck to a particular formula. Uh, we've gravitated away from a formula, and so that's part of the reason we're here this evening. Um, when we went to just adding an increase and did the whole harmless uh, process. But 93-94 was really the last time that we had uh, proper use of a formula, if you will. Up until 13-14, we have 67% experiencing a decline in student enrollment across the state. That represents 336 of the school districts. 162 experiencing an increase in enrollment, representing 130,000 students, and that's about a third. And then uh, one district uh, remaining unchanged. North Penn School District, our enrollment is presently 10% greater than it was in 93-94. So the last time we had that formula, which took into account the student enrollment, uh, we're up 10% since that point in time. Uh, we did hit a high point in the 0102 school year. At that point in time, we were 17% greater than we were in 93-94. So let's take a look uh, real quickly here at some more background information. State sources of North Penn School District revenue, the basic ed subsidy, and that's the primary part of tonight's discussion is the need for a formula regarding basic ed subsidy. But for, regarding basic ed subsidy, $8.9 million to North Penn School District. You can see we also get funding for special education. We have the uh, Homestead Act where we um, have a reduction in your uh, property tax bill if you're a homeowner. Uh, we have the FICA reimbursement. We have transportation. We have grants, construction reimbursement. And then, of course, the big one, uh, pension, $12 million. So out of all the items that constitute that $40.8 million, pension is $12 million and is by far the largest particular item that we get from the state in terms of state sources of revenue. Now, you recall the pension system is funded uh, through reimbursements from the state for 50% of the pension costs, and then the local taxpayers pay the other 50% of our pension costs. So changes in basic ed subsidy uh, regarding North Penn in terms of its total budget. And, and just in 2001, we had $7.1 million of basic ed subsidy. Our total budget at that time was $125 million. In 2014, the basic ed subsidy, $8.9 million, total budget of $223 million. So you can see it's been really difficult for basic ed subsidy, that portion of our total state funding. And as the previous slide showed, that's not the only part of our state funding. A lot of the increase in the state uh, supportive schools has had to go to the pension obligation. But regarding the basic ed subsidy, we've only changed from 7.1 to 8.9. And yet our total budget has gone up, oh, just about 100 million during that time period. And that's despite a lot of uh, cost cutting and uh, uh, work we've done really to try to keep our budgets uh, under control. We do have 200 fewer employees than six years ago. We've really worked hard to reduce our energy use. Uh, we've had other cost cutting strategies uh, but that pension obligation is continuing to climb and it's, it's really uh, costing the school district quite a bit of money and the state for their share. Also happening in North Penn School District, we have quite a, uh, an explosion in the Eng English language learner students. Uh, we're now spending a little over $2.7 million uh, just to help those students learn the English language. And that represents 477 students. And I have that uh, slide in here because that's important in terms of uh, our belief in regard to the funding formula um, because we think that you need to take into account the fact that there's some extraneous costs and they vary by school districts and North Penn is one that has a lot of English language learners. Quick snapshot of economically disadvantaged and you see the change in 2008 we had 9.8 percent of our students were uh, seen as economically disadvantaged according to the uh, federal criteria. In 2014 26.3 percent. Let's take a quick look at who are our largest taxpayers in North Penn. Merck. Merck pays $12.9 million in taxes, real estate taxes, to the North Penn School District. Montgomeryville Associates, Napa and Associates, KRM Montgomery, DCI Station Square, large property owners. Uh, in some cases, those are commercial property owners. In other cases, they would have uh, apartment complexes. Uh, you can see they would round out the top five. The Merck share is a little over 8% of our real estate revenue comes from one source alone, that being Merck. 
Median household income, uh, Tillmanson Township at 96,000 plus for the median household income, Upper Gwinnett at 102,000 plus, Hatfield Township 75.5, Hat Hatfield Borough at 55.9, North Wales Borough at 70,450, Montgomery Township a little over uh, 116.5, Lansdale Borough at 58.553. So the median household income in North Penn is 88,962. But you can see there's a difference in our municipalities regarding the median household income. So we do see a redistribution of revenue in the North Penn School District. Upper Gwinnett is town, uh, Township is the home to Merck. Yet all of our students, of course, benefit from the revenue that we get from Merck, happen to be located in Upper Gwinnett Township. Generally, our townships do have a higher median household income than our boroughs do. And as I said, all of that uh, real estate revenue and income tax revenue is shared by all residents of the North Penn School District via the school students in our school system. We do have man-made lines for municipalities and school districts. Uh, the revenue would vary depending where the line is drawn. We're just really pleased that we have Merck in our school district. They're not in a neighboring school district because you can see they pay more than 8% of our total tax bill. Uh, and, and I'll give you two other examples. Um, Upper Marion, Norristown example, the King of Prussia Mall, a big mall. Many of us use the King of Prussia Mall. It happens to be located in Upper Marion School District. If the line would be drawn differently, uh, the students that live in Norristown would be experiencing quite a difference in the available revenues uh, for those students. Likewise, if you're up in the Lehigh County area, Cedar Crest Boulevard is the line between Parkland School District and Allentown. If you live on one side of Cedar Crest Boulevard, you attend Parkland, you have all the resources of Parkland, and they're substantial. If you live on the other side of Cedar Crest Boulevard, right across the street, uh, you attend the Allentown School District and you have the resources of Allentown. Much more challenging situation in the city school of Allentown. So my point in that is those man-made lines, uh, we drew those up many years ago. We established municipalities, we established school districts. Depending on where those lines are drawn, they're different experiences. We do know that the real estate tax is a very unpopular tax and we know we need it uh, by the wisdom of the legislature then to have something called Act 1 and we uh, work with that. Uh, real estate property taxes do vary by school district. It does depend on the level of the development, the location of the development. Um, there's some differences in when the last reassessment was done with some counties reassessing more recently, other counties not reassessing for quite some time. The personal income per weighted average daily membership, WADM, and that's a term that we use a lot in the education world. The weighted average daily membership is basically your student body, and for years we've weighted the uh, secondary students are just a little bit higher than we do elementary students because it was believed uh, that uh, secondary students were more expensive to educate. Now that's starting to change uh, in time, but we still use the WADM, the weighted average daily membership. But the personal income, if you take all of the personal income within a school district, and divide it by the average daily membership on a weighted basis. It's very different. I'm gonna have a slide about that. I will have that in just a minute here. So that does make it difficult to uh, fund schools because there's a lot of reliance on local taxes. So I put this slide in just as some examples here in, in Montgomery County. Uh, you see the Colonial School District, an aid ratio of 0 0.150. 0 0.1500 is the lowest aid ratio. Uh, the state does not have a lower aid ratio, even if by calculation it would be less than that. And that aid ratio is a combination of the pure market value of all the real estate within the school district. That constitutes 60% of an aid ratio. 40% of the aid ratio is due to the personal income of the school district. And it, it's capped, if you will, in terms of it can't be a less than 0 0.1500. So, you have Colonial School District as an example with a 0.1500 aid ratio and the market value per Wadham, per student basically, is over a million dollars per student in terms of market value in that school district. The personal income in that particular school district, that being all the personal income within the district divided the number of students on a weighted basis, $383,968 per student basically available. Now that's significant because when you go to a levy a tax, you can see there's a much different impact on millage if you have a market value at one level versus a market value at another level based on all the development or all the real estate property in your school district. Likewise, when you have a personal income tax or you have an earned income tax in the case of school districts, that earned income tax brings in a, a very different number depending on the personal income within the school district. So you see some other examples on there. On the high end, you have uh, Colonial and uh, uh, Lower Marion in terms of market value per Wadham. 
uh, Upper Marion also a high um, market value per uh, weighted average daily membership with Sahican being at the top end there. Then you also look at the personal income and you see a big difference. Uh, Laura Marion having about eight hundred plus thousand dollars per uh, weighted average daily membership um, and that being the high in there. And then conversely you might have a, a Pottstown school district for example uh, with a much lower market value per Wadham and a much lower personal income per weighted average daily membership. So that's significant in terms of uh, the impact then of your local taxing authorities and the school district being one of those in terms of the revenue that comes in when you levy those taxes. North Penn is at 0 0.1876. Our market value per Wadham is $694,000 approximately, and our personal income per Wadham is $225,000. So nothing near the top, but not also near the bottom. Uh, here's a, a slide that shows the minimum aid ratio districts. Um, you might be interested in seeing Council Rock being one in Bucks. Um, and on down, I won't read all those to you in terms of, but one thing that's interesting in that is other than the Quaker Valley School District in Allegheny, all of the highest, and it's, it's a minimum amount of aid ratio, that minimum aid ratio, so the, the most wealthy, if you will, school districts, are in Bucks, Chester, Delaware, and uh, Montgomery uh, counties. So those, that four county area has the districts that are considered statewide to be the wealthiest. And again, you can see from the previous slide that uh, it's not uniform though, but in general, we see more wealth in this part of the state than we do in other parts. The exception there are Quaker Valley and Allegheny. The highest aid ratio districts, that being the districts that are the least wealthy, if you will, not having near the market value or the personal income in that particular school district, you have it, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, a couple uh, school districts within Allegheny County. So Allegheny includes one of the highest, uh, more wealthy school districts, and then also a couple of the least wealthy school districts. You also have in uh, Delaware County, Chester Upland School District being one that doesn't have nearly wealth as some of the other Delaware County school districts. So you see some aid ratios that go as high as 0.8959 uh, Reading School District. And the aid ratios have changed in the 10 year changes. You can see Camp Hill School District at one time uh, a much wealthier school district in 0405, their aid ratio was 0.2373. In 1415, uh, their aid ratio has changed and they're now at 0.4361, so they are considered to be less wealthy than they were back in 0405. And you can see some other school districts on that list for those changes in aid ratio. These are significant because as we've not changed and we've gone away from having uh, a formula to determine basic ed funding, and simply gone with a, a percent increase across the board or, or some adjustments here or there, um, we've gravitated away from the impact of aid ratio. And then you can see here districts that become more wealthy. Um, and again, I won't read those to you, but you can see some that were at you know, 0.49 and now at 0.3 for the top one there, the most significant aid ratio change out in Greene County. So the conclusion I made regarding redistribution is clearly wealth is redistri uh, redistributed within a school district. I talked about the fact that all students in the district do benefit from uh, Merck being just in one of our municipalities and all students in the district benefiting from some differences that you see in income of the residents of our school district. We do redistribute across our district. Uh, so we know that, but the big question is uh, how and, and what to what extent do we need to redistribute income across the state. And it's a philosophical discussion. It's a philosophical discussion because clearly children are born in the community. They, they have no control as a little first grader in terms of where they were born and what school district they live in and what responsibility and to what extent do we have to help all children across the state. And that's a matter of a lot of debate and um, you will have differing opinions about that. I put this slide in because I thought it was helpful just to show you uh, in 1983 we had the Equalized Subsidy for Basic Ed. Uh, that was Act 31 at that time. That ESB formula did take that aid ratio I talked about and multiplied it by a factor for educational expense and multiplied it by the Wadhams or the weighted average daily membership. At that time the factor for educational expense was set at $1,650. Uh, there was some additional funding by an economic supplement that did take into account poverty and local tax effort and population per square mile as factors. Uh, the legislation back in uh, 1983 did uh, remove that 50% state share. Uh, they were having difficulty meeting that expectation 
and it was decided that we would eliminate that from uh, the ESB uh, expectations. Uh, that did add a minimum increase at 2%, and we had that SB formula all the way through 91, 92. And then we got into something called hold harmless, and uh, we said, okay, we'll take what you got the year before, and um, we'll give you maybe a 2% increase or a 3% increase, more of an across-the-board kind of an increase. We did, at varying times, put other supplemental funding factors uh, in those that were done um, kind of uh, as, as support was there or not there in a particular year, um, low wealth, low expenditure, poverty, um, some limitations of revenue, small district assistance, enrollment growth. Some of those different things were factored in, but we really gravitated away from a true formula. So there's a lot of discussion about a new formula for adequate and equitable basic ed funding. And uh, I say adequate and equitable because there, there's, again, a lot of debate about are we talking about the same pie and just the way we divided, or are we talking about a different sized pie? But no matter, if we're going to go with a new formula, and depending how we use that formula, uh, we need to make sure that we've taken care in determining the, the factors that constitute that formula. So there is a, a group of uh, a coalition of, of varied interests across the state that have gathered together, and uh, they're making a recommendation to us. And uh, the recommendation would be that we take some sort of a base cost, we, we figure that out across the state, and uh, we consider in there the number of students, so that's in the formula. Uh, we take that statewide average of an actual instructional expense, and then we also factor in some student-specific weights, so that if there is a lot of poverty in a school district, they would get a larger piece of the pie. If you have a lot of English language learners, you would get a, a, a larger piece of the pie. If you had a lot of homeless students, you would get a larger piece of the pie. Likewise, there would be some district-specific weights in there, depending on the local wealth, the local tax effort. Uh, sparsity is important to some of our rural school districts. And then uh, charter tuition and the impact of charter tuition in your total costs. And we'll have an opportunity for some comment about that. Um, but we had a meeting uh, just, um, it was the first meeting of the month for North Penn School District. We had some presentations that evening where we talked about uh, the basis for this new formula being recommended by this group, uh, as I said, a coalition of, of varied and diverse interests across the state. There is a uh, basic ed funding commission that's been taking testimony. Uh, Senator Pat Brown and, and Representative Mike Verb, I believe, are the co-chairs of that uh, funding commission, and I gave some testimony to that commission, as did some of the other superintendents from, uh, from the county, um, and, and Todd Stevens was a part of that also, and Todd's with us this evening, Representative Stevens. So, um, they're working hard on uh, taking testimony across the state to determine what should be the new funding formula. We did have a similar commission that uh, studied special education costing, and they, um, I think, uh, represent, excuse me, uh, Senator Brown was the, the leader of that one also. Um, they did come to a conclusion on special education funding, and uh, they're starting to put that into place. So I thought that was very successful, and I'm looking forward to the outcome of that uh, basic education funding commission. Now, I mentioned earlier Hold Harmless, and what Hold Harmless uh, did was uh, we, we, we took what you got the year before, and this was back in the early 90s, and we said, um, as a state legislature, we'll give you a, a percent increase. Uh, we'll make sure we won't give you less than you got the year before. Uh, in the beginning, you didn't see as much of an impact as you saw over time. Over time, then, the impact of not including the number of students, not including changes in aid ratio, not including all those changes that are happening within a district uh, has become magnified. So over time, especially the districts with declining enrollment, uh, would see a, a pretty radical difference if we applied this new formula that we talked about earlier. And naturally, that's, that's a concern to those districts, one that we certainly understand. Uh, likewise, are districts like North Penn, and we did a little work and we said, what if we would have used the formula as it was in 1993, the last time we had used it, what would North Penn be getting according to that formula? According to that formula, North Penn would get about $5 million more in state funding with the pie being the same size, just a different distribution of that pie. So those districts that have significant declining enrollment, recall North Penn is up 10% since 93. Uh, those districts that have significant declining enrollment naturally would be getting less, and those that have grown would be getting more. In our case, it's about 58% more that we would be getting had we continued to use that particular formula. Uh, nonetheless, we're talking about a new formula, and that was that, what that previous slide showed. Uh, we do know that uh, over time we're going to have to be careful uh, with transitioning because uh, we have concerns for, for everybody. 
Um, it's a thorny issue, as I put in this particular slide, on how you transition to a new formula. If the size of the pie is the same, some districts would get a larger piece of the pie and some would get a smaller piece of the pie. Uh, naturally, those that would be set to get a smaller piece of the pie would not be happy at all. Uh, those getting a larger piece would be pleased, uh, depending on um, how much larger, uh, even more pleased. Uh, if they're transitioned over time, the districts which, according to the new formula or restoring the old formula, whatever it might be, uh, should be getting more, they, that would be delayed and um, you know, they would be hoping it would be accelerated in terms of that transition. Possible solutions, of course, and we'll talk about this this evening. Uh, and I'm curious to hear what our representatives are hearing in Harrisburg and what Tina's hearing. Uh, but we could apply the new formula and just eliminate hold harmless. And I said earlier, uh, those that buy that formula would be getting a lot more would probably be pretty pleased. But those that uh, have benefited from hold harmless uh, would be not all that pleased because of that new hole in the budget now. Or we could only apply the new formula to new money and we could continue to hold harmless. Um, depending on how we do that, we either would uh, just derive new money from same sources as before and it would take quite a while. Or um, depending on your, on your appetite for a change and uh, the significance of that change, you could increase state funding via some increase in income or sales taxes and either uh, concurrently reduce property taxes to some extent or perhaps even eliminate them. There are different uh, considerations, different possibilities out there being discussed. Um, but again, if you wanted to shift, uh, you could increase your in income taxes and your sales taxes and reduce or eliminate your property taxes. Uh, and then when you get down into the details of that, you could reduce your property taxes for homeowners only. There's a proposal out there right now that would do that or you could just reduce your property taxes for all property owners. So lots of different considerations, lots of things being discussed. Uh, a new bill just uh, um, entered recently. Uh, I don't recall the sponsor's primary, uh, primary sponsor's name. I think he's from central Pennsylvania. Could have been HB 650 or 850. I don't remember the exact uh, name on the 1189, is that what it was? I thought it was 860. 860 is the one I'm talking about. Seth's is 1189. Yeah, another consideration there. Ty, we can talk about that in just a minute. Um, so those are some things that are being kicked around now. The governor has a proposal uh, that certainly is going to generate a lot of discussion too. So that's, uh, that's where we stand right now. Um, and that gives you some backdrop or background information. So what we're going to do at this point in time is I'm going to bring our panel forward. We're going to take questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we'll take comment and uh, we'll have our legislators and Tina provide some insights. If you guys could come forward now, that would be great and have a seat up here at your name. Um, we'll take some questions um, and you can share with us uh, what, what you're hearing in Harrisburg, uh, what some of the issues are that you're grappling with and what you see as uh, the probability of certain uh, solutions, if you will, to deal with this issue of state funding. So if you're watching at home, uh, start to send your questions. Uh, you can send them to NPTV at npen.org or to the uh, link that we have on our website. If you're present here in the audience this evening, and I'm pleased to see uh, folks that are here this evening, I'll come around with a, with a microphone and uh, take uh, questions from you. Um, for those that, that just had a seat up here, uh, if you just want to make a couple very, I'm, I'm going to ask you to be very brief, uh, kind of opening kinds of comments, uh, that would be appreciated, but we really want to spend time taking questions from the audience. So any of you want to start and then uh, we'll give everybody an opportunity for some brief comment and then we'll take questions. Is this on? I don't. Yeah. Okay. You know, I just want to comment on a couple things that uh, uh, that were mentioned that we before as far as what was shown on the screen. Uh, you know, a lot of the school districts are in the state have uh, as was mentioned there had 300 pupils or less in the whole school district and that was done when we actually combined a lot of school districts down to the 501 and now 499 which we had and the reason for that was the the kids being bused in some cases in the uh, Potter, Tioga and those counties uh, they would be on the bus for an hour, hour and a half and it was too long you know, for the kids to be on the bus. And this was in the morning and the evening. And so uh, that was why those school districts were created, you know, with those few kids. 
and uh, it's something that's tremendously costly, but it's also, uh, you know, for those people that live in those districts. So I just wanted to mention that, and uh, you know, and well, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk to you know on the budget, but I'm going to hold off on that till later on. Um, first of all, it's nice to be here. Um, I think Dr. Diedrich did a great job on that presentation of showing numbers, and I, I found nothing surprising, but I do think it's a pretty complicated subject, and I'm really glad that you went through how it's done, not just in North Penn, but in, in the southeast of Pennsylvania generally. And your numbers also showed how big the state is and how different it looks from one corner of the state to another. I think there's a mistaken notion out there that, um, you know, we take 10 or 11 uh, billion dollars every year and just sort of throw it out there. But that's actually not true, and your presentation showed that. We have a formula, but it's old, and it's become skewed because of the hold harmless. Hold harmless was put in there for all the right reasons. School board members needed to budget what they were going to get, so Harrisburg sort of made them a promise you won't get less than last year. And um, that was seen as a way to help local school boards, you know, figure out what are we going to get? Oh, we won't get less than we got last year. And it was a good thing. But over time, what it did was just increase the disparities between the formula and the population. So, I mean, think back to where we were 20 years ago and where the North Penn region was. And actually, the North Penn region's gone up and come down a little bit. And, um, and that's kind of normal for the suburbs of southeastern Pennsylvania. So clearly we have to take another look at the formula the, um, and, and how, uh, how we dole out the money. There was one thing that your slides didn't show that I always worry about, and that is where is the money collected and where is it spent? Right now in the North Penn School District, you raise 80% of the money here at home and your locally elected neighbors who are on the school board dole it out you know um, some of the proposals to either have a sales tax or higher or a broader sales tax or higher or broader income taxes would take that money to Harrisburg and then send it back to you one worry I have coming from this part of the world where all of my school districts do what you do which is raise and spend the money at home and also are benefited by good tax rateables like Merck and other places um, is that if you lose the ability to raise and spend the money at home and that money goes to Harrisburg, I don't think you're ever going to get it back. I just think that's the way it's always been. So I'm very suspicious of proposals that would change the taxing structure from a local taxing structure with aid from the state to a statewide taxing structure that would take your money, send it out to Harrisburg, and maybe dole it back, or maybe not. So uh, I just think that was the one thing that was kind of missing. Where is it raised? Where is it spent? And um, that's one thing I'll be looking for um, in any proposal to change the way we fund our schools. Um, you know, it, it's Kate said it very, very well. Dr. Dietrich, I don't know if you can go back, how easily you can go back to that slide that showed the number of districts that have grown versus in, in population versus the number that have shrank in population since the, uh, the change adopting the hold harmless provision. But I think you just... There's this slide and then we have some... Uh, no, there's the one with 300, 336... Um, okay, I got you on that one. There we go. Okay. So in 2008, um, I first campaigned for the state legislature and I campaigned on the issue of the unfair school funding formula. And since I got to the state legislature in 2010, every single budget year, I have complained and pounded a podium and got up and press conferences and whatever else you can do to try to draw attention to the unfair school funding formula and the fact that um, my four school districts, uh, North Penn among them, only receive 15 to 18 percent of their total funding from the state. Just so you know, the statewide average is 35 percent. So we're about half of the statewide average. There are some districts that get 78 percent of their funding from the state. Now, the, the, on the flip side of the coin, um, we actually received an email a couple of years ago from one of our colleagues who's no longer in the legislature 
at one point prior to the budget, he said, um, and it was sent to the entire, either the entire Republican caucus or the entire House, but he said, hey, my district gets 70 percent of our funding from the state, so if we cut education funding, um, it's going to have a major impact on my, my taxpayers. And I think actually, I think uh, Representative Harper replied and said, you know, cry me a river. Uh, um, you know, we're, that mean, <laughs> we're, we're, only, we're only getting, you know, a paltry uh, 16, 18 percent down here. When, here's the challenge though, and the reason why we haven't been able to, to make the changes that are necessary, it's basic math. To get anything done in Harrisburg, to get anything done, you need 102 votes in the House, 26 votes in the Senate, and one governor. And when you look at those numbers and you see that 336 school districts benefit from the hold harmless provision, and 162 do not, when you put a bill up for a vote to eliminate that provision, you have representatives from 336 districts that are against you, and you have 160 district, 162 districts worth of representatives that are with you. And simple math, I know everyone in this room and everyone watching understands simple math doesn't, doesn't get you where you need to go. And that's the challenge we face. I mean, you know, we, I hear you, and, and I've, you know, Dr. Dietrich has been a, a terrific, um, just, he's helped me tremendously in bettering, better understanding of the formula, what the formula used to be long before I got to the legislature and, and what's happened since then. Um, and uh, we, he, I've sat in his office, he sat in my office. Unfortunately, we need the numbers in, in the House and Senate in order to get a change. And, um, and one of the things that to, to follow up on Kate's comment, there are some proposals out there regarding property tax that say, oh, well, don't worry, because we're gonna give you, it's gonna be dollar for dollar. We're gonna increase the sales and, and income tax this year and we are gonna give you a dollar for dollar exchange for the property taxes that you are currently paying. Well, that's all well and good for this year. But when you have 336 districts situated in one manner and 162 situated in another, you always are concerned about what happens. The minute we send all of our money to Harrisburg, we cede all control locally for those funding decisions. And you now are subject to the whims of my colleagues in Clarion County and, and Indiana County and Tioga County and, and every other county across the Commonwealth. And there's nothing against, look, nothing against my colleagues. They have to look out for their school districts the same way we're trying to look out for ours. So uh, that's the challenge we face as legislators um, up in Harrisburg when, you know, you just need the numbers. You need 50% plus one to get anything done. And, uh, and the challenge is, is reaching that number. Thanks for having us. I appreciate it. Can I just comment on, you know, everything that was said is absolutely true, but at the same time, most of those school districts with a real high aid ratio are the ones around the state with maybe two, three, four hundred kids in the whole district. And it, it's, you know, it is a problem. But, you know, I've been in, the, I guess, more than, I've been here for a while and uh, in Harrisburg, and uh, I know we fought those battles, you know, at budget time, year after year after year, but it's, we didn't have them in the early part of my career. It was only when we put the damn old harmless thing in there, and it was because of those school districts that out in those counties in the west and the north central part, of the northwest and north central Pennsylvania, that were losing kids hand over hand because the economies were nothing, and they were losing kids, and uh, we had to do something to try to save those school districts and keep them semi-solvent. So uh, that was what developed, and uh, fortunately at this point, they don't need the monies that they do have but because of Marcellus Shale. Marcellus Shale has revitalized the whole, you know, north, central, and northwestern part of the state. And they, those people at this point, for the first time in a long, long years, uh, uh, have been able to uh, make a decent living, and their jobs available, and good paying jobs. So. Uh, you know, what happened to them, they were going way down, you know, at least the economies in those areas are coming back up. Thank you. Tina? Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, especially with um, such esteemed colleagues as uh, the state representatives. They are the ones that are going to ultimately vote on whether or not there will be a formula, so it's very important that, that we have um, discussion about this. Um, 
I am a member of the campaign for um, fair education funding. Um, the Pennsylvania Intermediate Units um, have become members along with the other education associations. The most significant thing about the campaign is that it is made up, as Dr. Dietrich said, said of a variety of interested um, community members from across um, the sections of, of this state, and it is not just education associations. So we have our business community that, that is also uh, very active in the campaign. We've been studying this issue regarding the formula for over a year now. Um, there was great thought and effort put into um, devising a formula that could take into account those factors that really do drive the costs in the districts. So looking at both student costs and district costs. And yes, that it, the hold harmless issue is a very, very important factor for many districts across this Commonwealth. However, if there is a formula in place that takes into account many of those factors, then um, our analysis on, on behalf of the campaign is that only 18 school districts, not 336, but 18 school districts would um, then have to have some adjustment to smooth the bump um, so that they would not be hurt in the process. So we're hoping that the, the um, Basic Education Funding Commission does um, issue its report, its findings. Uh, it's due out June 10th, and um, all indications are that they are really looking at those factors, and they are going to address the hold harmless issue. So our hopes are there that that, that will be taken into account. But last legislative session, um, especially last budget, um, there were no mon new monies proposed in the basic education funding line. And the specific reason given was that without a, f a true formula, there was no reason to continue funding the basic education funding line with more money. So now we have the opportunity to create the formula and therefore if there is new money, then distribute it according to those factors that really drive those costs. Thank you. At this time, we'll open it for questions. And as, as I said, this is an extremely important part of the evening. So I will move around with a microphone. And uh, if you could ask your question into the microphone, um, that would be wonderful. If you uh, don't mind, identify yourself. Uh, but if, if you don't want to do that, that's OK, too. Uh, we like to get to know people. So if you, if you can do that. And I'll, I'll come around with the microphone. I see one hand right here. Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my question is on how you're voting for this formula. In the budget, in the governor's proposal, from what I read in the newspaper, there's also a piece about charter schools. I'm not an optimistic person about this formula, as sorry, you just stated about the 336. But on the charter schools, if you could focus in on that, North Penn, right now in North Penn, we pay. $11,405 for a regular student, $26,890 for special ed. We pay $1.7 million. Next year, we may have coming online an additional $1.8 million. It's my understanding from what I read in the newspaper and your presentation, Tina, that the governor is proposing a cap of $5,950. Is that vote, I guess a couple of questions. How really, what are your feelings on that kind of a number coming down from you know, an average of 11, 12, who knows what the other school district pay to this 5950? And is that going to be a separate vote or is that going to be included in one large package vote? All right. Can I, <laughs> let me ask you a okay, question. Okay, we're off. First. Here we go. <laughs> let me right. ask you hey. a question first, sure. um, Dr. Dietrich. <laughs> what is your total budget and how much money are you spending on charter schools? Okay, um, I can use this one. We're at about $227 million total budget, and then the charter expense is around $1.7 million. Okay, $227 million is the budget. Correct. $1.7, almost of $2 million charter. are charters. Correct. Okay, and I'll answer your question, but let's talk about this for a second. The vast majority of education spending that we do, okay, are for personnel costs, human beings. 
because the teachers and everybody else who, who runs things comprise usually, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of the budget. So um, many senior citizens falsely believe that it's swimming pools or football fields or things like that. It's not. It's the basic cost of having a well-qualified teacher in the front of the classroom and, and taking care of the business of education. So um, it's important to remember that while charter schools may be seen as a budget problem, they are not the biggest issue in budgeting for education, not at all. Now let me finish by saying that the House did consider a cyber charter funding bill, which would have reduced the money going to cyber charters, because it's obviously cheaper to educate a student in a cyber school than in a brick and mortar school, than in a, a building like this, okay? Um, we actually did consider that, and um, there are also bills that would reduce the, the amount spent on charters generally to try to account for those things that uh, regular public schools have to pay for that charters or cyber charters don't fund, okay? And, and let's talk about the easy things. On the cyber charter bill, you got to cut out lunch money or uh, stuff like that because cyber charters don't offer those things. So we actually do understand that we've got a problem, particularly with cybers. But as for all charters, I believe that, um, you know, school choice is been a long time tradition in Pennsylvania and parents should be able to choose. The fact that so little of your budget goes to charters is really a credit to you on the school board and to the teachers for offering such an excellent education in your own public schools that parents don't feel a need to look elsewhere. It really is a tribute to you and you, you don't have the issue that the city of, Char of Chester has where two thirds of all of the children are in charters because the regular schools are so bad that the parents are voting with their feet. So I hear you, we probably should tweak the charter formula and we're willing to do that. We already put that up for a vote and uh, I, it passed. I don't know what happened to it. Maybe it's over in the Senate it now, but the Senate. okay. But we did, we did do that and we're willing to do that. But please don't focus on something that takes a million dollars or a million seven out of your budget when you have much, much bigger issues. Okay. Representative Stevens, Representative Godshall. Yeah, I just wanted to, on that question, you know, what percentage of the budget in North Penn is locally driven? And uh, what percentage is, is state driven? Uh, I'll back that slide up just a minute and we'll find that one. Basic 80 20, that right? No, I'm not talking about basic. Yeah, I'm set. talking about the, uh, I'm, I was talking about. It's the uh, early slide, 79%, you know, I think it was from the real estate tax. Salaries usually are someplace 65, 67%. You have debt service, you have so, you know. And then another 15 to 18 percent, maybe 20 percent in my district, with that 105 million dollar school uh, that we put up for 2,100 kids. Soderton. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and you know, so you know, all of those things are not driven by the state. So when you add them all up, you're at 80 some, 85 percent are locally driven. I mean, we don't set the salaries. We don't have. I mean, that's not state. That's your, you know, so you have about 15% to 20% that actually is state driven of your whole budget. You know, that's state driven. 80% is at least 85 is driven right here at home by you. My concern is, we're short 6.7 million dollars in our budget in every. My concern is that we are 6.7 million dollars short in our budget and every little bit helps. So my question is, focuses on charter schools because I don't have too much faith on this basic formula. I'm not trying to drag this out, but every little bit helps. So if I can save $1.8 million on our 6.7, that's more instruction we can do. It's more teachers we can hire. That's our classes. There's so many things that million eight can do. Sure, and I think um, to echo Kate's comments, um, we 
last session there was a bill too. I, mean, we, I think, I, I know I can speak for myself. We want to get to the heart of what are those expenses that are excludable. And so for instance, the charter schools don't have to pay to transport the kids. So that should be d reduced, that should be deducted from what the charter school is being reimbursed. And expenses like those, uh, I agree with you 110%, should not be sent over to the charter school because they aren't providing that service. But for the services that they are providing, I think it is fair that they be compensated at the rate that the, the school district would, you know, would be paying to uh, provide those same services in the district. So the issue becomes, what are those services? And that's where the debate has, has gone last year. I know we, last session we had a, uh, a debate on that and, and we talked about the pension double dip. There's considerable discussion um, about that. And, and again, you know, to, the, to that point, we ought, to be, we ought to be compensating those charter schools specifically for the cost that they are incurring, not providing a double dip, not providing these, these extra supplements. Right. And so I, I, think, I think to the extent that you are asking us, would we agree, or at least to the extent you're asking me, would I agree that we need to make sure that the payments to the charter schools reflect the actual expenses that that charter school incurs for educating the child? My answer is yes, I am in agreement with you on that. All right? But I also think we ought to talk about pensions, which consume a far greater part of your budget than charters. We'll get to that in just a second, Representative Harper. We're going to have Tina talk a little bit more on the issue of the charters, and then we'll let's let's go to that then. Let's and Rep go. Representative Stevens did hit hit the nail on the head, and that is looking at the actual cost um, with regard to online um, delivery of instruction. And the reality is, is the current system of funding cyber charter schools is the per pupil allocation each district has. So you may have a school district. Take, for example, North Penn, um, and your per pupil allocation could be $11,000. That's your, your expenditure for a regular education student. And then another district in another part of this, this state, um, their per pupil allocation is $7,000. So you have different districts sending different amounts of money um, for the same exact cyber school. You can have students in, in this part of the state and another part of the state receiving the same instruction, but the cost is different. So the, the cyber um, reform right. bills are a reflection of that and a, and a look at what it takes to actually deliver that instruction across the Commonwealth. And in the governor's proposal, the reason the $5,950 was selected was that the um, governor's administration looked at the top performing online programs and they actually were um, provided by the IUs and looked at the top three IU programs and the costs associated with those online programs and the figure $5,950 um, came out to be the amount that it cost to serve those students. So instead of $11,000 from North Penn and $12,000 from another district and $5,000 from another district, $5,950 was the, the amount that really did take into account all those costs. Okay. Representative Harper, pensions. Pensions, if Thoughts that's on the pensions. big one, isn't it? It is I the mean, big one. We have a slide on that, I think, we that do. shows you yeah. what the pensions are costing percentage-wise in your budget. We do. And in ours. It's $12 million from the state goes for pensions uh, in terms of the North Penn School District. Uh, we're at approximately 21% of payroll. The state contributes half of that. We're going up to 24.5% of payroll, if I have my numbers correct. Right. So that's a very significant carrying cost. We're heading up towards 31%, eventually 33% of payroll, half again being borne by the state. Very, very significant uh, cost there on pensions. I'll get that slide up, but go ahead and make some comments on pensions. All right, uh, we're struggling with this. We have, as, as I see, we have two problems. We have a gigantic hole. The pensions are underfunded. Okay, so we have the, how do we fill the hole in and make sure that we can uh, pay the pensions that have been earned and, and keep the promises that have been made. And then we have a stop digging problem, which is going forward, if you look at um, people in private industry, they don't have a defined benefit pension plan um, as is currently uh, available to teachers and state workers. And um, for that reason, 
you know, when you divide it into two pieces, we can solve one, it won't solve the other. And so we have a number of proposals that have been floated and that I wouldn't mind hearing, you know, opinions from people on as to whether or not new teachers only. We're not talking about anybody who's retired, we're not touching your pension. But if we don't do something, we won't have enough money to pay your pension because we are tremendously underfunded. Okay, so, but we are talking about maybe putting new teachers, uh, new hires on either anything from a defined, defined contribution plan where everybody agrees on what the employer is going to put in every year to a hybrid, people get a defined benefit up to $50,000 $50, and over that they get a um, defined contribution and to, or to switching to simply defined contribution. Did I miss anything? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah we've had we've had a whole lot of, of proposals but we know we have the two problems we need we just need more money uh, we counted on uh, the investments producing 70 percent of the money that was needed for the pensions and it hasn't now in my own defense in 2001 there was a pension increase was very generous I voted no and I didn't take it because I was afraid it would raise real estate taxes at home. But I gotta tell you, we had a flock of actuaries telling us everything would be fine. We could afford to do this. An awful lot of uh, teachers took that pension, then retired, and are now, thank God, living longer, healthier lives. I'm cool with that, but it's expensive. It's expensive. And, and so that's the problem. So I think we have two problems. We have to. We have to find the money, and I have proposed a tax on the Marcellus Shale to find the money, mm -hmm. to fill the hole in. And then I think we're going to have to reduce, uh, have a reduced benefit plan or some kind of defined contribution plan or something like that going forward so that we can reduce the cost in the future because they don't get any lower. They do level off, but they level off at a very high rate. So that, that's where I am on pensions. So. Um I think there's just a, a couple points. I, I agree with Representative Harper uh, completely here, um, but I, I do think it's important. What's that? That's unusual. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think she laid out the problem very well. I do think that um, it's important to note because there's a lot of talk, and I hear from, from taxpayers quite a bit, that says, we ought to just move to a defined contribution plan. That's what the private sector has. And I hear that all the time. And um, there was a proposal to do just that last session, and I was shocked. Um, one of the benefits of this job is you get to really dig in on issues and become educated um, in a lot of different fields. Uh, so ac some actuaries took a look at that proposal, and they actually told us in the actuarial notes that um, that approach would add an extra $40 billion to the unfunded liability, which um, really shocked me, frankly, um, and I, you know, I had to do some digging and, and some research and speak to some financial folks and actuarial folks to really make sure I had a, a handle on why. Um, but, you know, that, that becomes a challenge. And really, it's, in a nutshell, the, the reason why is if you think of your own retirement, um, you can invest differently when you are 25 than you can when you are 55. As you get closer to closing out the existing pension plans that our employees would have, you would have to back off of your investments and be less aggressive. And therefore, you have to reduce your expected rate of return. And when you do that, it, it creates a massive, I mean, these pension funds are massive. So when you start shaving percentage points off of your expected rate of return from your investments, you end up impacting the bottom line very, very significantly. So. Um, there was a proposal last session that I did support, and that was um, uh, a proposal that was called a, a hybrid plan, a, a stacked hybrid plan, where, as Representative Harper explained, the first $50,000 would be a defined benefit plan. And thereafter, everything above $50,000 would be a defined contribution plan. So, you know, there are a number of employees, frankly, um, who are, are making, you know, our, our staffs up in Harrisburg, you know, make in the, in the high 20s. Um, they're not the folks who are, who are driving this pension problem, um, so to speak. And, you know, I, I think it's, it is important for some of those employees, you know, to, look, the, the, in the past, the idea was 
you're making less as a, as a state employee or um, in many respects um, a government employee. So the trade-off was you did have a defined benefit plan that you could count on for your retirement. And uh, for many folks, that still is the case. You know, they aren't, they aren't making a, uh, a ton of money in, in for the form of a salary. So for them to have a, a guarantee and a defined benefit plan, I think, is reasonable. Um, I also think that it's reasonable to say, hey, look, if you are at the other end of the income spectrum, you know, maybe you should be in the market with the rest of the taxpayers in terms of your retirement. So we have that safety net we're still going to provide um, in that, that approach. But above and beyond the $50,000, you know, you're going to be in the market with, with the rest of us. Um, and I think that, that that approach was a reasonable one and a sensible one. Um, it didn't have the votes to pass last session, which is why it wasn't brought up for a vote. And um, I understand the Senate is uh, working on some pension legislation um, this time around. The House, in the, in the last couple sessions, the House has been the one that's taken the lead on the pension issue. And in this session, the Senate is taking the lead on the pension issue. So we'll see what they come up with and, and what they can garner the votes to pass to send over to the House. But I can assure you it is a hot topic. To the extent that your budgets are impacted, um, as you pointed out, the state pays half of that. So every, every amount of pressure you are feeling, we are also feeling. Um, you know, our, our line items for the pension contributions are going up just like yours are. Um, we have 500 school districts to deal with, that, and, and we have a larger population, admittedly. But I just want to let you know that we are feeling the same pain you are. Um, you know, we're watching our obligations in that line item increase every single year, and it's crowding out, you know, the opportunity to, to focus on some other areas that we might want to focus on. It's, um, it's a challenge. You know, I, I showed up in the legislature in 2010, and they did make some changes in 2010 to ratchet back the benefits. Um, you know, they went back to the benefits that existed prior to the increases in the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that has helped. I mean, certainly, I don't think anyone would disagree that the changes made in 2010 helped significantly, but there's still more work to do, and, and I can tell you we are, we are working on it. But it is a very complicated issue. Uh, actually, as Representative Harper pointed out, two very complicated issues to deal with. Representative Gossel. Everybody's finished. I'll try the third man out here. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I, I just want to say on the pension issue, you know, my figures for North Penn in the last five years have gone from about $3 million for the state contribution to North Penn to $12 million. So we've That's upped correct. what we paid, you know, uh, to the, the school district. And it was $12,152,000 in uh, the, for the present the present year that we're in. And, but the other thing, you know, I sit on the State Employees Retirement Board. So, you know, one of the biggest thing in going to defined contribution, you know, as I see it, is we'd have, with all the new people coming in into a separate pension system, uh, they'd be in a defined contribution, we're in a defined benefit at this point. We have less and less people, we have more people retiring, that, but we have less people paying in all the time. And so that is the real problem because we have, and their pensions are going up, but we have fewer people paying in. And so that's the real problem. And the, you know, we, you hear all kinds of figures about pension plan, like the state employees, this is not the teachers. We have two pension systems, teachers, the teachers, and we also have uh, uh, SERS, which is State Employees Retirement Board, where I sit. And it's a $30 billion pension fund. And uh, the average pension that we have in the state of Pennsylvania on SERS is right around $25,000. A year. A year. So, you know, you hear all kinds of figures and so forth. I don't know about research, but that's ours. You know, that's what we pay out. But we have a real concern, as I said, of going into this defined contribution because there's going to be less and less people paying in. And that's what costs the $40 million that you said it's going to cost us because we have fewer people paying right. to uh, the retirements. Uh, so set. that's where we sit. But the state is making an effort with that going from five years from three million to 12 million, you know, to this school district, you know, to try to help on that pension issue. 
the, the Senate did indicate from the start of this legislative session that this was a number one priority. They set aside SB1, Senate Bill 1, as the bill that was going to be the pension bill. Um, our understanding is that it's going, there's going to be language that will be released uh, very shortly, hopefully within another week. Um, it also will be interesting to see what happens with um, the new executive director of PEASERS um, in a month's time because uh, Representative Glenn Grell who was a proponent of pension reform last session had a bill that actually um, had some some following behind it except that one was uh, to also float a pension obligation bond mm -hmm. to support the unfunded li liability he is now stepping down as a state representative and he is going to head up the PEASERS system. So um, we should uh, anticipate that there will be much discussion uh, upon his taking place as uh, the executive director. We in Sarah's do work with PEASERS, you know, back and forth, and uh, Glenn Grell is very well qualified, yes. and I think is going to do an excellent Absolutely. job over at PEASERS. Very good. Let's go to questions from the audience. I'm going to come right here in the front. So, you know, Private industry is going to, my pension's being frozen in two years. I'm lucky enough to have a pension. People in my company 10 years ago that were hired, they get, you get 4%. So personally, I think moving to something similar for the teachers and for, you know, maybe state look at it differently for state employees who are, you know, maybe not making the same type of money that some of the teachers are making, you know, that capped contribution should be looked at. My question is, I'm looking at $12 million, $24 million for North Penn annually, you know, just this year. What are we doing for taking that money that's going to go to pension and putting it back into basic ed subsidy? Because I'm hearing a lot of getting the bill down. Nothing's going back into the basic ed subsidy. So if we're talking about trying to get more money into the schools to teach the kids, how is this formula going to take that into effect? Well, let me just answer one thing. Okay. The pension payment is not just for retired teachers. It's for teachers who are currently working. It's, it's the employer's share of their pension. So it is a direct salary cost. It's a benefit, just like paying for health insurance or anything else. And I actually avoid cutting it out, except when we're talking about what are cost drivers, you know, vis-a-vis, um, -vis, say, charters or something because it is, a, it is a cost of having a well-qualified teacher in the front of the room. It's just killing us because it's too generous or too big or we don't have any money, you know? I mean, that's it. That's what I think, go ahead. No, I mean, agreed. I mean, it's, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we, we've got a challenge. I mean, we, we're in a situation where our revenue, our, our expenditures are continuing to grow at a rate that is exceeding our revenues. And, you know, and we're, we're restrained because promises were made that have to be kept. So, you know, what, what do you do? It's okay. beyond promises, though. It's a contractual obligation that was set forth. Right. So, T you know, Tina's a lawyer, so she just pointed out the obvious so, that we didn't say. So thank you for that, which is, you know, if, if we offer somebody a pension when we hire them, they get that pension when they're vested. It's a contract. It's a contractual relationship, and you can't change it midstream. Is that a fair That's assessment? We could change it for new people, but we can't change it for somebody who's already got it. Now, in private industry, they seem to be able to do it, but government cannot break the contract. Uh, that that issue was taken to uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court right. on uh, at least two, if not three, yeah. um, occasions during my tenure, and in each case, the Supreme Court said that a contract, a state contract, is a state contract. So it's, you know, we're in a bind. The only thing we can do is change the, you know, change it for new people. But at the same time, you know, as I said on the state board where I sit, you know, the, the, we, we have the money coming in and the money that we can make on investments. And I, we knocked off, I guess, a billion dollars last year on investment profits that we made. So that's the only avenues that we have. Uh, we make the investment profits, and uh, then we uh, have people, uh, you know, we've been lucky, I guess, we had 08, 
which we got killed. We went from about 29 billion down to 24 billion, you know, with 08 coming along. We're back up now about to about just about where we were before, which is 30. And as I said, but we're, you know, making money, and we have been making money in the last, last number of years, and that's going into that system to try to get rid of some of the, the backlog that we have and the unfunded balances that we have. Okay, next question. Uh, I want to bring it back to the uh, basic ed formula issues. And right now, I, and this is, please correct me if I'm wrong, but we're waiting for them to come forward from the commission to make a recommendation. And I'd like to encourage our state representatives to be aware of a couple of major things about North Penn that a lot of people have misconceptions about. Um, we have, we do have an affluent district. I won't, I won't say we don't, but I want you to be aware that when we come up with a formula, and if it comes forward without some special features that would definitely hurt us, the first issue is poverty. One quarter of our kids are in poverty under the federal guidelines. Uh, yet people think North Penn's a rich district, and that's something I want you to be aware of, because if a formula comes forward without some factoring in of poverty levels, it's gonna hurt us no matter what. Or if not, it'll at least not benefit us to the degree it should. And the other thing is our population with English language learners. Uh, North Penn has a, a, a history and a strength in the diversity of our community. Many of you were at the uh, international festival we had this past weekend. Um, but without that acknowledgement uh, of that diversity factor in that basic ed formula, because there is an additional cost when you have somebody come here that doesn't have uh, English language skills, that we have to spend resources to make sure they, they catch up, if that's the word that we can use in this case. Um, but that factor also has to be put into the formula. And I would suggest, and, and this is only my opinion, please do not support a formula that doesn't have factors taking into account for us. And then I'd like to reserve a comment on the pensions. So, um I What's mean, last word? I'm, glad, I'm glad you echoed it, uh, or I'm glad you said it, because that was, to be frank, um, when the School Funding Commission was out here in Montgomery County, and I invited uh, Dr. Dietrich and Dr. Griffin from the Happer Horsham School District to go and testify before the, the commission, uh, I think it was Dr. Dietrich that made those points to the commission to talk about how those are real cost drivers. And from my perspective, that's what we need the commission to focus on and identify for us. What are the true cost drivers and what is the factor that should be attributed to each of those cost drivers so that we can come up with a, what is a fair formula that, that fairly reflects the actual cost to educate a child in each district across Pennsylvania. So um, to the extent that you know, North Penn uh, is looking at poverty and English language learners, I, I would agree, but I also, just to be fair, I think any of those cost drivers, and Dr. Dietrich um, you know, listed many of them that could be considered, um, that might not be prevalent necessarily in the North Penn School District, but other school districts. I mean, if we're going to come up with a fair formula, we've got to look at everything that could be a cost driver. Um, and I, I think it is important, I share your thought, your, your feelings on that, that whatever formula is adopted truly reflect the costs associated with educating a student. I want to say that um, it's a misnomer to think that those factors are not in the current formula. Um, they are. And for that reason, um, Philadelphia gets more than half of its budget from the state of Pennsylvania, and you get 10, 20%, okay? So they are in there. And uh, I think it's um, important that they are in there because we do know that it costs more money to, to uh, have uh, children who need language teachers in addition to other teachers, we know that. We also know that children who come from difficult home lives or don't have enough food to eat um, need more help and, um, than children who are fortunate enough to have better circumstances. That's already in the current formula, and I believe that that will continue to be um, in the formula because Pennsylvania has a constitutional obligation to uh, provide a a fair education for all of the children in the in the Commonwealth so it's 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 in there I think it should be in there and I do think that most people would be surprised to hear that I think you have like 30 languages spoken in North Penn right Correct. a Something lot like more that? than that 67. 67. Yeah. 67. Yeah, 67 okay so so that's huge and and I do think those factors will be in the formula because we know that they are cost drivers 
but there are also district factors beyond the student factors. The, um, North Penn is fortunate that you do have the commercial tax base. There are many communities, though, in Montgomery County that do not have that. And that is of great concern for those districts. So your neighboring districts don't have that commercial tax base. Um, the example used of, of Upper Marion versus Norristown. And so you, you, district factors have to be looked at, too, in terms of the local tax effort. Right, but that only matters if we still have local taxes. Correct. I mean, there Correct. is a proposal to get rid of local taxes and collect Absolutely. them here, take them out to Harrisburg and send them back, okay? And uh, we're probably gonna vote on that in the next couple of weeks. So the fact the local tax factors only matter if, we're, if we still have a local funding system. Yeah, the uh, point on the uh, pension plan issues, and we're all aware of the severity of the problem for everyone, including the increases that'll come still. Um, but the idea that, and, and I want to make sure you understand this, we have 200 less plus employees than we had just a few years ago. So the idea that we could shift the burden of reform to the new people coming along when we're not hiring new people uh, doesn't work. I mean, when I look at our population of our teachers, the years of service we have, we have under 50 teachers, I believe, with over 25 years of service right now. So our population is very young, so it would take decades to benefit from that possible change. And I wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Right, for but us. there are something like 70,000 teachers across the state of Pennsylvania, so. Well, there's only 895 here. I get it, I get it. But if we make a change to a benefit that, if, that we're half paying for and you're half paying for, it may not impact North Penn right away, but eventually it would impact the whole system. Okay. We're going to go now to Mr. Berger. He has lots of questions coming from our uh, viewers online. We'll take one of those, then I'll go back to the audience for the next question thereafter. All right. Uh, yeah, we do have a lot of questions coming into us from the website. I'm going to kind of take three questions and make one super question out of them for you guys. Um, That's yours, Bob. Who's going to win? Yeah, who's going to win the box mod? So here we go. Uh, would would the representatives be willing to break ranks with party leaders to benefit North Penn taxpayers? Is there a timetable on legislation impacting change? And what current proposals are our representatives willing to support? Bob? <laughs> Can you repeat there, the there, second There is probably, uh, right. in the House, there's 203 members. So there's probably 203 ideas you know, on what to do. Now, I'm being facetious when saying that, it's, it's, but it's, there is probably going to come down to about two or three proposals, but I, you know, I, I, you know in my situation, I, I'm sitting on the inside, and, I, and there's other people, legislators, that are on the outside. I'm not saying they're more or less intelligent than me, but I just happen to be where I'm sitting. And, and I do know what the impact is going to be, you know, on our system, depending on what we do. And I, for one, don't want to uh, encumber the citizens of Pennsylvania with $40 million more as some people, you know, with their ideas of what we should do in the pension. And it's just in coming together, and if the Senate, you know, I have no idea what the Senate's doing as of this point. I know that they're making it the number one priority, and they said they don't want to vote on the budget till we vote on pension, which I totally agree with. But, you know, I don't, we haven't seen anything coming forward, you know, at this point from the Senate. And I would think from what they have said that uh, that's going to be, they're going to pass it. And if they pass it over there, you know, depending on, you know, we're going to be hard pressed not to follow suit. Uh, I would say that uh, now's a really great time for this forum and that question because Pennsylvania, being a balanced budget state, has to balance its budget by June 30th. I know the school board has to balance their budget by the same date. And um, I think we're going to see a lot of activity on all these topics uh, before or during June. And hopefully we will get it done. I can tell you, and I'm going to say this even though people are going to send me hate mail tomorrow. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> I am not voting for House Bill 76 or any version of the governor's budget that requires a shift in taxes from local real property taxes to services. 
In our area, it means that seniors who are getting home health care, young families who are paying for daycare services, people in Brittany Point would be paying a 6.6% tax. That's my brother. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'm not, I'm not voting for that. And it would take all the money to Harrisburg and dole it back. So I am not in favor of either the governor's proposal to do that or the House Bill 76 proposal to do that. I missed the second. I think you made this. You, I got the first question. I'll give you okay. an answer to that. Uh, what, is there a timetable on legislation impacting change? Change to the formula? Is that? I assume that's what the, the question meant. Yeah. Okay. And then what's the, what was the last? Uh, what current proposals are our representatives willing to support? Okay. Um, so as it relates to whether we'd vote against our party for the benefit of the school district, again, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. Um, I'm surprised you didn't. Yeah, well, I was going <laughs> to um, You are looking at three people who um, stand up routinely and uh, in our own caucus. We, look, we have a very diverse caucus. And, um, you know, when you're a Republican from southeastern Pennsylvania, things look uh, very differently than um, from other parts of the state and other perspectives. So uh, the three of us uh, routinely are standing up um, to help educate our colleagues about our perspective and, and the pers perspective from our taxpayers. Um, just anecdotally, during redistricting, my district became more independent. And I jokingly said to the now Speaker of the House, I said, you know, it, um, Mike, my district is more independent. That means I'm going to have to vote more independently. And he said, you couldn't vote any more independently <laughs> <laughs> than you already do. Um, so, and I wear that with pride, frankly. Um, you know, I'm there to represent my taxpayers and my residents, and, uh, and, and that's what I try to do every day. As it relates to uh, the timetable, we've got the, the balanced budget requirement. This funding commission is supposed to have some recommendations to us, you know, by the end of the year. Um, you know, I, I was joking with Representative Harper earlier, hopefully they don't come on June 29th and are presented to us for a vote on June 30th. That's not that far out of the realm of possibility for the way things go during budget time. Um, but for, again, for three members who like to really dig in and, and make sure we fully understand every facet of every issue, that's a challenge. Um, and, uh, and on the last question, I, I agree with Representative Harper 110%. We cannot send all of, our, all of our money to Harrisburg for them to make the decisions about how our schools are funded. It doesn't work particularly in our, in our area of the state, but particularly in the North Penn School District and others similarly situated. So um, I cannot be for that. Last session, I was um, the first co-sponsor on House Bill 1189, which was uh, introduced by Representative Seth Grove from York County. That would have allowed a tax shift. What it would have done is it would have allowed local school districts more options of taxation so that they don't have to rely exclusively on the property taxes and then, you know, uh, to a small extent, the, uh, the earned income tax. So um, it would allow for some greater flexibility. I actually, um, during the discussions about that bill, was in communication with, with Dr. Dietrich pretty, pretty regularly. Um, sorry about that, by the way. Uh, um, but, um, you know, to, to hear his thoughts on the impact here at North Penn, um, that bill, I, I spoke with Representative Grove. He is not reintroducing that bill for some political concerns. Um, and, uh, and I have it uh, on my desk ready to be reintroduced, either as an amendment to a, pr a property tax proposal that would do what, Repre what Representative Harper described in sending all the revenue to Harrisburg for them to, to send a portion of it back to us, um, or as a standalone bill. So um, that's, that's ready to go. And to me, that addresses the issue that we need to see addressed. Allow the schools to look at other, other methods of taxation that might better reflect someone's ability to pay than property taxes do, but keep the money local. So the decisions are made locally. You still are subject to the Act 1 index. You still are subject to those limitations. But at the same time, it gives you, as a school district, more flexibility to look at your own population and craft your tax policy that makes sense for your residents and your population. And I think that's the way we need to go. Okay, I, just, I just want to comment further on that. as. Somebody in Harrisburg who has voted for every budget except for one in my entire career. Uh, this budget here that we have presented by the governor, uh, as of right now, could be another exception. Uh, in North Penn School District, the governor's, uh, the new sales tax 
And with all the new additions in the sales tax and the personal income tax and the increase there, would increase the taxpayer's cost by $54,631,713. It would, that's what the, the governor's budget would cost. 50 in this in this school district 54th million six hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred and thirteen dollars the what the what they would what this area would be getting back uh, would be in rent and property rent relief and uh, property tax relief is ten billion is I'm sorry is fifteen billion and ninety seven thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars so a net loss of $39,533,000. And in Satterton, where I live, uh, the impact, the cost would be $24,242,000. Uh, we would be getting back under the Wolf Plan in property tax re, uh, ref reductions of $10,934,000 or a net loss of, to the district and to my taxpayers of $13,308,000. So, you know, that, that I, as I said, I voted for every tax, every tax, every budget that's come along, which were the tax increases that were there, but this is, you know, unbelievably, and it's a debt that I'm not sure that we can begin to uh, put onto uh, our people. So there's got to be some changes, and uh, as far as June 30th, uh, Kate mentioned that this is when we have to get the budget done. During the Randell administration, I think we averaged, we get, we're getting them done one time in December, December. and another time in, you know, in, November. in November. And yes. I think we averaged about three, four, at least three, four months late mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, during the whole, his whole career So uh, as governor. And uh, he... Uh, we got it done. He insisted on what he wanted and uh, and what he would like to see in there. And I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen this year, but the plan that's on the table from the governor just doesn't help you and doesn't help me. Okay. Next question from the audience. We're going to go back to the audience. We're going to go over here on this side. Thank you. Yes. Uh, was. Uh, your explanation about the uh, PSERS board chairman uh, change uh, sort of tell that we're going to be uh, funding the uh, pension deficit with the bond issue? No. Um, Representative Grell last session introduced a bill um, that was a proposal to fund the, un the, the liability, the unfunded liability, right. by floating a bond. And now he's going to be the chairman of the PSERS pension. Well, board. he is stepping down as state, state um, representative. He's going to be the executive director of PSERS, but he does not dictate I understand, what, but that, th what that proposal is. Well, I'm is. on the board and I'm involved with politics, so I know what usually ha that means. And, uh, but I, I would support that if they would, if you would vote to uh, fund the, uh, the pension obligation liability with a bond issue. Uh, money's so cheap right now, um, your expected rate of return is probably greater than what the interest rate on a bond issue would be right now. So that would probably help um, close the, the uh, liability on, on the, pen, uh, the pension fund uh, deficit. And, and, so. and his rationale for that was that even if you did shift um, individuals, new, new employees into a defined contribution plan, that you still have the issue, as explained by Mr. Shapinsky, that um, you, you still, you, you have to wait many years before you see any benefit to that, whereas you're still going to have that unfunded liability that's driving up the cost now in the school districts. I understand, but solving half a problem is better than solving none of the problems. So that's how I, I look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other piece is um, with the uh, thoughts on the charter school and the percentage of the budget that we had uh, budgeted this year, it didn't start out at $1.6 million. I believe it was like $6 million at the beginning of the year. But some charter schools that have applied to 
to uh, set up shop in the, our district um, weren't able to uh, open its doors. So I think we're scheduled again or budgeted again for six million dollars above uh, five million dollars for next year. So if that trend keeps going up, we'll be at the pension level <laughs> um, within two or three years of maybe funding twelve million dollars worth of charter schools in our budget instead of you know one one million. So. There's a there's an uh, uh, you know there's an uh, um, a chance that that may happen that more charter schools will be coming to our district. Okay, looks like we have another question. We'll, I'm right here, so I'll go here, then I'll go to the other side. As a member of the North Penn School Board, we have all talked a lot about the funding. In January, we kicked off the the fund the equitable funding, and as a board, what should what could we do? How, how, can, how can we help? Can we expect that our legislature is really wants to do this? I mean, Dr. Dietrich talks about the pies. Is this pie in the sky? I mean, we talk and talk and talk. Do you think that we can possibly solve this in this state? Well, we're a balanced budget state. Um, revenues have been flat or a little bit bumpy since the fall of 2008 when the recession really hit us and it was the worst recession since the Great Depression. I personally don't think we're out of it yet. So in good times, revenues from income taxes, business taxes and sales taxes naturally go up. People get raises, they pay more in income taxes, businesses do well, they pay more in business taxes and people feel flush, they go to the mall and do some discretionary spending. That is just not happening in the robust way that it used to. So that leaves us with one choice. If we want to have more spending, we need more revenue because we don't print money in Harrisburg and we're not allowed to deficit spend. I mean, we're not Congress. So if, if we want more money, the best way you could help us is tell us what taxes you want us to raise. You know, seriously, no, you what revenue. taxes do you think we ought to raise and that you would support? Because we don't have any other way to get money but asking all of you, send us more money. So if you want us to set, spend more money, you got to tell us where you think we're going to get it. No, I agree. I mean, some, something has to give. And we, we've talked among ourselves how upset we are about young people in this state who are not getting a decent education. And those of us sitting here in this district 13th in the nation with our academic decathlon. This, this, we, this community really, really would put out for education. And I know I'm going to get laughed out of the room, but we have not used our exceptions. And I would be willing to use one exception every year to give to some, someone who, who needs it. And I know in, that's- Within your district, within you'd be willing district. to raise taxes here over the Act 1 index a little bit, but what For are we going to more gonna, money here. That's your choice. But, You're the school board. But That's somebody, the ha somebody has to start giving if we're going to have this state come up to what it should be. Something, something's going to have to be done. Right. On local taxes, that's a school board issue. You all that's have right. to make those choices. And they'll think I'm crazy. But nonetheless, if we care about other people in the state, I mean, part of it is that we have to start caring about more than ourselves. And if we don't start doing that one at a time, it's never going to get done. Okay, thank you. I did promise coming to the other side. I'm going to take this one first, and then we'll move to the other side. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Leonard. Um, uh, earlier, you said that you would be willing to uh, tax the Marcellus Shale. Mm -hmm. At what percent has that vote come up yet? And would you be willing to use a large percentage of that percent to fund the pension uh, deficit? Yeah, I actually have a bill. Yes, it's uh, very similar to a bill proposed by Democratic uh, Representative Madeline Dean. Mm -hmm. Hers goes to education generally. Mine goes only to pensions. It would be a dedicated funding stream to try to fill the hole that I mentioned earlier. Um, my proposal would be to keep the local impact fee in place. Uh, by the way, it goes statewide. Montgomery County got a, got a million dollars out of that last year and gets about a million every year. From the local impact fee, it also takes care of environmental programs as mitigation. So I'd keep the existing impact fee in place, and I would add about 2.5%. My reasoning is that I don't want to be higher than 
West Virginia because the Marcel Shale is one of the bright lights of our economy and I don't want to drive them away. So, but I would, I have that bill and it would put all of the money into pensions. It's in the Environmental um, Committee at the moment. I'd like to comment on that. Uh, the Marcellus issue, when the governor came out with his billion dollars for education coming from the Marcellus shale at a 5% tax, it didn't take long for the inquirer to come out on the front page and say that 5% tax on Marcellus amounted to not a billion dollars, but a million uh, sixty-five thousand dollars, or uh, 165,000, I'm sorry, 165 million dollars rather than a billion. Because he was basing his figure of 5% on a figure of, of the tax up here. Unfortunately, Marcellus Shale, which at one time was $14 uh, a thousand cubic feet, was down to about $1.25 a thousand cubic feet. So in order to get that billion dollars that he was looking for, it would take a 16% tax on Marcellus on top of the $225 million that they pay for an impact fee already. And it's for an industry that's operating at less than, well below cost. Uh, it just it doesn't make sense. In Pennsylvania, there were over 160 drillers uh, drilling in Pennsylvania at one time. There's now less than 50 drilling rigs in Pennsylvania. And the Marcellus Shale, the last time I checked, the wholesale price was a buck and a quarter to a buck to a dollar fifty. And the governor had based his five percent, as I said, on some fake figure up here. So the media, the governor did recover. He said he was going to tax it at this higher rate, even though the rate was the the going rate was down here. He was going to have create an artificial rate to get his billion dollars. Be the same as buying gas at a gas station, and you're supposed to be paying the gas the tax on the what you on the gallons you buy. Well, this wouldn't be the case in Marcellus Shale. It was a 16 percent tax. It, it just won't work, and we're going to kill an industry that uh, we're going to that that's benefited an awful lot of people. And they're paying $225 million now. Okay. And plus, also, corporate taxes, which, uh, corporate taxes, which uh, they don't have in West Virginia. Right. Right. I'd say I agree with Representative Gottschall's analysis, both of the industry and of the governor's proposal. Mine is different, much smaller, because I do recognize that the industry's been good for Pennsylvania. Uh, in many ways. I would also point out, though, that Pennsylvania's natural gas industry is greatly affected by things happening in other parts of the world, including the formerly OPEC nations mm -hmm. manipulating the energy market. Pennsylvania is the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, and I would not tax them so much as to lose that. All right, we're hitting on all the important topics here. Marcella Shell, of course, being one of those. The next one, I promise, was right here. Hi. Uh, I want to go back to the whole pension issue and in non-legal terms, non-legal non speak, could someone give me an explanation high level as to why the contracts cannot be changed when in fact in 2001 the contract was changed? At least it was only in my changed mind. for people. It, it was increased. Right. For Taking retirement. it away is the problem. But let's let Tina talk about that because Thank she's you. skilled at that. Go ahead, Tina. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> um, this was litigated several times. This, this issue with regard to the contractual obligations and it, it, it would require, um, if, if there's an attempt to change the, the contractual obligation, then it ends up in the courts. It, it guaranteed that there, there will be a lawsuit filed um, to, um, recover those those promises that contract and in the past when those attempts have been made the courts have not found in favor of that because they are um, state run pension systems and that that's been the findings in the court whether or not that's going to happen this time around um, it's yet to be seen you don't know what the court will do but that that is one of the factors that that everyone is looking at is is what would happen in the court. And, and just to 
piggyback off of that a little bit. One of the concerns, because I've heard folks, intelligent attorneys, you know, who are very well respected. Um, I thought those attorneys were all intelligent. You're right. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, very well respected so cool. attorneys, um, and not even just attorneys, non-lawyers say, right. you know what, the pension plan, the pension problems are so bad, you ought to roll the dice and take a chance. Maybe the court sides with you. Right. Here's here. There's a couple problems with that, but one of them is one of the factors that got us into this mess was on the employer side the employer was not making the actuarially required contribution for many many years and that had a dramatic effect mm -hmm. on the overall pension pension systems well if we were to go ahead and roll the dice as some would suggest and then budget based on our roll of the dice and then a case works its way through the courts and takes some years. time to get through years and then the court says by the way you weren't allowed to do that what are we left with all we've done is exacerbated the problem right. because now we will have not made the we will have artificially reduced our contribution for those you know years in between the time we made that decision and the time the court rendered a decision and we've only made the problem worse and that's i think one of the concerns when when i hear folks say well you ought to take a chance doing that you know that's that's Again, there's several concerns with that, but one of them is, you know, it, it really, it really might do a lot more harm than good. Okay. I, I, I just, I just want to, you know, on that same issue, it wasn't only, uh, you know, it was also the state that didn't pay their share because we didn't have to. Uh, we were in my, on, in the board that I'm on, we were like 115, 120 percent funded, so we didn't have to pay, and we didn't, but then. 08 came and just knocked the stuffings out, you know, from under us. That was, uh, you know, and we really got hit and got hit hard. So that was the problem with the state. It was the employer and the state, both, that didn't make their contributions when they should have. And just to clarify on that, uh, certainly I'm not suggesting the, and I, if I did, I apologize, I'm not trying to suggest the entire problem is a result of employer uh, the employer side not making the actuary requir required contribution. It's really three factors. It's the market losses from 9-11 and 2008, mm -hmm. the, um, the reduced contributions, and the generous promises. So it's the combination of those factors. Um, one factor that I think is important to note is on the employee side, they made every contribution that they were obligated to make. Um, along the way, and I think that is something that that needs to be noted in the discussion. You know, uh, that was um, that's something that oftentimes is lost in the in the dialogue. Okay, we're actually a little beyond what we thought we would be, but uh, we're still seeing some hands up. I'm going to try to take a couple more questions. Yet, I see one right here. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of things to address since we've covered so much. Um, first. Um, Back to the pension, uh, is any of the health care part of the pension? I mean, I didn't see anything where our cost is for the health care for our retired. Is, is it part of the pension? It's not part of the pension. But I assume it's a rather large amount. It depends on that. Okay. Um, anyway, my, my concern uh, was that we are continuing uh, to do health care. Health care. Dale, it's separate. Okay, we're continuing to do health care for our retired seniors, and yet in the, in the private sector, I'm finding that many of our very large companies are getting out of the health care business because the Medicare um, given by the government is such a cheap, inexpensive, and very, very good health care that the state and the school district should be considering something along those lines. Uh, also, I'd just like to comment that on the that guaranteed 2% that we can't get out of, it's difficult. Say that again. Todd, you mentioned, I forget what you call it, that, that what came in for the guaranteed 2% that the school districts, the formula that you're using presently that got us into this long, the, the, the hold the harmless. Hold, the hold, the hold the harmless. Hold harmless. Uh, since it's so difficult because of the 300 and some districts more against the 168, um, couldn't we put this up to a vote across the entire state and let we taxpayers tell you what we think should be done? I mean, we, we pay you to be up there and do that. I understand that. But sometimes it gets a little unfair the way it's set up, just from what you said. I mean, we could, but it would take a vote to put it up for a vote. 
Well, maybe you guys. You, should... I mean, we would we would have to vote. I, it, to to break it down in a nutshell, one night the former speaker Sam Smith, right when I got to Harrisburg, I said I got to work on this formula, and he said we well, need to come up with a supplement. I said why? He said. Well, I can't ever vote for less money for my school districts the same way. Well, maybe you guys you should consider for this for us as, as you know, your taxpayers. <laughs> but the problem that we are dealing with tonight, and I think we all realize it is, these are extraordinarily complicated questions. And you move one lever up and the other goes down and vice versa. And we are studying it and we are trying to understand the impact on Pennsylvania and on our districts. I don't think a referendum is the way to go with this. I think, I think we got to figure out what would be the right way to do it and try to get consensus among the members. Okay, I promise this individual next. Hi, Ben Littman. I'm also running for North Penn School Board and it's a pleasure to see many of you again today. And uh, I've seen many of you speak before. I'd like to uh, ask you about a couple issues. One, you mentioned about uh, food service. With uh, the USDA allocating roughly about a dollar per student lunch uh, after all costs have been removed, and with North Penn having such an excellent athletic program and uh, STEM program, with uh, about 20% of your glucose intake going to your brain, just its basic functioning, and without properly uh, feeding these students, is there any way that the state will be able to introduce anything to uh, help properly uh, uh, satisfy these students' uh, hunger needs? We do have programs for, you know, in, well, in some systems. You know. Right, we have programs for children who, who, um, who are in poverty, who, who need... Below the poverty the, line, yeah. Yeah, who need the help. Um, we're not big into deciding what people should eat for lunch. I'm not anyway. Mm -hmm. But that that does exist today. I know there's a student. Uh, there's also breakfast even programs that the state has, and it, it it goes on. It's totally based on poverty. I'm aware of a lot of different programs, and Pennsylvania does do a lot that other areas of the country don't. But you did mention also like Chester City, which is classified as a food desert and just worried about more proper nutrition, like tomato paste not being considered a vegetable with all the other ingredients that are added into it. But is there anything that you would be uh, willing to do down the pipeline to help with that uh, issue? Well, I didn't hear his last question. Okay, so I understand your question. Your question is, uh, would we be interested in legislating what kinds of food can be served in the school cafeteria? Not me. Uh, I'm, I'm not for that. And my second question is, with uh, taxation uh, issues coming up in the budget, would you be willing to give tax incentives to schools for cyber program? One uh, growing higher education area is online classes or hybrid classes. Would you uh, be willing to introduce that uh, program in the high school level so that when these students graduate, they're able to have a stronger foundation for those areas of classes. I've been a uh, supporter of the hybrid learning program. Hepper Horsham was one of the, uh, the pilot schools that was involved with it. I actually um, wrote a letter to then Governor Corbett um, uh, asking him to, to ensure that we at least maintain the funding that was in the budget. I guess it was two budgets ago. Yes. Um, and, um, and fortunately, we were, we were able to keep that um, that funding in the budget. So I, I think that's a terrific program and I, you know, I certainly encourage schools to take a look at it. I think it's, um, I think it's worthwhile and I think, you know, neighboring school districts are, are equally supportive of, of the concept. Right, I'd also like to say that the state supports the community college system a, as a way uh, to provide some, some more learning opportunities for people and we are very blessed to have, I think, the best community college in the state, if not the country right here in Montgomery County. It's a terrific education, it's a terrific value, and um, we all support that. Okay, we'll go to one more question here from Mr. Berger. All right, this is actually gonna be, I guess, directed at you, Dr. Dietrich, that- uh, All right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> give, uh, give these guys a break. Uh, it was reported in local media that you know, the potential for uh, the folks in Harrisburg not meeting the budget deadline is a possibility. What sort of an impact would that have on the North Penn budgetary process? 
Anytime we're in that situation, it's certainly complicated. We do uh, much, much, much prefer if the state can pass a budget on time. It helps us to be able to plan much <laughs> so more appropriately. So we want that to happen. In the absence of that, uh, then we work with the best information that we have, and then we would have to use any kind of existing reserves or fund balance in the event that uh, the number would be radically different from what we, uh, our best information indicates we would be able to have. So fortunately, we are in a position where we can make that happen if necessary, but that is not our preferred choice. Our preferred choice is to be able to plan accordingly and for the legislature to pass a budget on time. Can I, can I ask a question about that, actually? Um, my understanding, one of the challenges I've had is getting the most current data out of PDE sometimes, and I was told during that, um, you know, everything seems to be like a year or two old. Um, and one of the reasons that I, I was given was that the actual payments to the districts don't happen, I mean, they don't happen contemporaneously. So you're not getting paid in September for what you're doing in September. That they're a year behind in many respects. Um, and that, I just, I wondered if maybe you could share with us, frankly, some of the timeline just from a cash flow perspective. And I will say, I guess too, at least this is one of those times where it might be beneficial that 80% of your funding is locally raised. <laughs> uh, that, that's correct in terms of we don't get all our money on July 1st for the entire year. We get uh, payments in different increments as the year comes along like that. Uh, fortunately, on a cash flow basis, if you're looking in terms of, you know, can we continue to run the school district, as you said, with that local revenues coming in, the majority of our income comes in right then around the end of August into September time period like that. Uh, and, and people want to be able to get the discount on the, on the real estate taxes and everything like that. So cash flow wise, we're okay, uh, especially with you know what we have uh, on reserve and we're able to manage our cash flow like that. Uh, plan con, the money we get from construction reimbursements uh, can <laughs> sometimes really <laughs> lag. Uh, those lag sometimes significantly. There have been right. some moratoriums on those uh, and they're held up uh, because of that. And that's another point of a lot of discussion. I know the hour's late, but that's something also that I know the legislature's grappling with and how they want to handle those construction funds. Right. I just want to ask you to go back a second. You just indicated you get most of your money during the real estate property tax discount period. Correct. What's the percent? Well, of, we have about a 97 percent, depends, 96 and a half percent overall collection rate. Uh, we have our business manager who can give you a little more precise uh, numbers in terms of what is in and who pays during the penalty period or the lack of the, first it would be the lack of the discount, then it would be the penalty period. So I'll put Steve on for that one. Good evening. We actually received the lion's share of our collections by the end of the discount period. So we like have- Like 98%, 97%? Uh, more like about 94 okay. percent by the end of the discount period. So they have, there's four months to pay. July and August are at the discount period, and then uh, September and October at the base period. So the lion's share of property owners pay during one of those two periods. All right. So even though people don't really like paying property taxes or any taxes for that matter, from the school district's perspective, it's a pretty stable source of income. Very stable source. That's one of the redeeming qualities of the very unpopular property tax. It's a stable <laughs> revenue source for those who uh, levy the tax. It's okay. very predictable. You know what you're going to get. By and large, we're right around that 96, 96 and a half, 97 percent collection rate. Eventually, all, collapses, uh, all taxes are collected, but in terms of either paying on time or paying it um, you know, within that um, time period where there's a, a, a slight penalty, we get almost everything. Then there's some that lag for years, and we go right. after those later. But it's only 169 million in our 227. Okay. I, our folks have been up here for about two hours now, so I am so appreciative. Will you join me in thanking them for everything they've done this evening? I, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, I really appreciate also the questions out here. I spent 17 years on the Saturn School Board, so I know a little bit about what goes on in school boards and, uh, you know, what they're up against. So that was, uh, but that was during the good time. We, if, we raised, <laughs> if, we, if we raised, you know, taxes at all, you know, we would get shot. You know, it was... Uh, <laughs> But uh, you could shoot back. that was we we had money coming in. We had money coming in, and uh, we didn't have a, you know we didn't have a problem. So thank you for tonight being as courteous as you are. Thank my colleagues. I think for for us, it's a little nervous to be sitting up here, but I think uh, I think it's great that you held the forum and that so many people asked so many intelligent, well thought out questions. Thank you very much. Are we doing the thank yous now? I um.
again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's always, it's always great. I actually learn so much from the questions because I, I love to hear what people are thinking, what's on their mind, what are the issues that are important to them. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I think, frankly, you know, it was made mention of it earlier that North Penn School District is, is one of the top academic school districts um, in, in the Commonwealth and frankly in the country. And that's a true testament to uh, everyone here at the district, starting at the top and, uh, and with the school board and, and right down to the teachers and, and the aides and everyone else who, who makes, this place, uh, makes this place work. So um, I'm just truly blessed to, to represent a portion of the North Penn School District and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, a big thank you to all members of our panel. They'll be here if you have some questions that you still want to ask them individually, I'm sure. Like always, we will forward all questions that came online to all members of the panel. So thank you so much for your participation. Drive safely. All right. Thank you, Dr. Deacon.